right, so why should anybody care about natural language processing? Well, there's three things that are going on that are pushing the field commercially and scientifically. And the first one is that there's just an enormous amount of knowledge, um, and we'll talk about what I mean by knowledge, um, available in machine-readable form as natural language text. So the obvious things are the web, right? But newspapers are online, the Wikipedia is online, dictionaries are online. There's all sorts of sources of what you could call knowledge available to a computer that's in machine-readable form. Why is it in machine-readable form? Because it's out there. Right? You can write a crawler, you can go to the web, you can get it, and you can suck it back. Um, that's driven an enormous amount of, of progress in the field in the last couple of years. Now, I should contrast that with what you might, how many people have taken an AI class of some kind or another? OK. I, I ask those kind of questions during the course of the semester, you'll see, and I don't have any idea what to do with the answer. It's like you know, a third of you have taken an AI, AI class, so a third of you understand what I'm talking about. A traditional way of doing things in AI is to build something called a knowledge base, which represents for some kind of closed domain in a formal representation the knowledge that a system would have to have in order to operate in that domain. It's extremely expensive, requires an intensive amount of work by human beings to build that knowledge, and it turns out to be extremely brittle because if something happens to the system that's simply outside of the hand-coded knowledge that somebody's put into the system, then they simply break. All right? That's sort of a way of building knowledge-based systems, of building intelligent systems that require knowledge. What we're talking about here is now it's become obvious that, well, why, why do that? Right? Why not build a system that can read the Wikipedia? And then if it needs to know the population of Bosnia or the capital of Estonia, right, you just look it up right, just by looking it up by reading the page, what, rather than having to have somebody in a dark hole cubicle someplace in Texas writing down facts in first order logic and then putting those into a knowledge base so that when somebody asks what's the capital of Estonia, it knows the answer. Now, you're laughing, but there are people who are employed doing that even as we speak. Right? There's a project called Psych, CYC, which we'll talk about, which is employing people to write down what they call consensus human knowledge facts in first order logic and putting it into a knowledge base and then releasing that knowledge base for a large sum of money. You know, the modern way of looking at that is like, look, fine, if somebody's going to write a Wikipedia page for free and it's relatively accurate, sort of, um, but why not just make use of that? All right, so I've beaten this point to death, right? So there's lots of stuff that's out there. All right, the second thing, which we're going to talk about a little, but is not going to be the primary focus of this class, is that increasingly when you want to do something in the world, particularly in the commercial world, what you wind up doing is talking to a computer. Now, I'm going to remain agnostic as to whether or not that's good or bad. Right? Some of you might want to call up United Airlines and actually talk to a human being. Now, I've talked to the human beings at United Airlines. Maybe that's not such a great idea. But I'm not, not clear that talking to a computer owned by United Airlines is any better. But the fact of the matter is that the trend has been, you know, customer service representatives used to live and work in places like Thornton. And then they all got fired, and the call centers got moved to places like India. And then they all got fired. And the call centers were eliminated and replaced by computers, right? And much of that is driven by speech recognition, being able to recognize the speech that's coming in over the telephone, natural language processing on the back end to figure out what it means when you say you want to go to Baltimore, and then speech synthesis coming back to you that says, your flight leaves at blah, 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 or your flight is delayed, blah, blah, blah. Right? So increasingly, that's the, that's the name of the game. You go to the airport, and you're trying to get hold of your credit card company, and the first thing it says is, say your credit card number. Not clear that's a great idea. Um, let me exercise some of your mathematical abilities here. Supposing I told you that the speech recognition for digit recognition was 99% accurate, and standing in an airport saying a 16-digit visa number is what you're being asked to do, how often is that task going to succeed? I make that a homework. <laughs> but you have to think about what 99% accurate means and what that 16 means there. And how many times are you going to have to say your credit card number before it actually works? How many people have actually interacted with one of these things successfully <laughs> and enjoyed it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So increasingly, that's that's a lot of what's going on. All right. Um, somebody should go like this. If I'm belaboring a single slide or a single point, Chris, you do it. Just say. Go on, all right? Um, and the final point is kind of a new one. Um, 
but and it's kind of a subtle one, and we'll talk a little bit about what it means. So much of human-human interaction is now mediated by computers. This is not true about my mother. It's not even true about me, but it's probably true of most of you. How many of you have a Facebook page? MySpace or something like that, right? How many people actually use it for something? You're all too old for that, <laughs> right? So. Facebook, social networks, LinkedIn, MySpace are all becoming increasingly important in the commercial world and in the social world and social interactions between people. If you're not aware of the fact that Facebook and Google and Yahoo and the National Security Agency and the CIA and the KGB and whoever else you want to talk about, your employers, um, there's a vast computer infrastructure that is basically monitoring everything you do. Who you talk to, who you're friends with, who they're friends with, what their income is, where they shop. So there's a huge amount of information out there. It's there, it's being used, and so part of what we'll talk about here is how that happens and how it can be used. And again, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, but social networks are out there. So you're laying yourself out um, when you open up your Facebook page depending on what you put on it. All right, so there's lots of stuff going on. Um, part of the reason that uh, this class is probably as big as it is is because when I first taught this class 20 years ago, um, I think I had eight people in the class, and I think four of them knew why they were there. And it wasn't because they wanted to get a job doing natural language processing, because getting a job during, doing natural language processing 20 years ago um, meant getting a job as a professor teaching natural language processing. Right? There, was, there was no, there was no jobs because it didn't work. Right. Well, we'll talk about it, how much it works now. But there are jobs to be gotten, um, and there's a lot going on here. And I just want to say a couple of things. So, um, how many people have heard of PowerSet? <laughs> how many people have heard of PowerSet? Who didn't take my information retrieval class? Daniel. <laughs> um, so they were a company a couple of years ago that was basically going to revolutionize the search world. And the way that it was characterized in the newspapers was they were going to knock off Google uh, by providing natural language search. And by, what, by natural language search, what they meant was that rather than indexing web pages as bags of words, which is essentially what Google does, they were going to actually provide systems that read the web pages, formed a semantic representation of the meaning of the content of the pages. And then when I walked up to the web and did a search, it wasn't just going to merely match my keywords against the bag of words indexing the pages. It was going to understand my query, having understood the web pages out there, and do all sorts of wonderful things. Um, well, it worked well enough for Microsoft to buy them. Um, it's not clear that it actually works, but, but again, we'll talk about that later. Um, the bullet down at the bottom is a company called Umbria. Um, so nobody here works for Umbria, do they? Okay. <laughs> see, 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 it never used to happen when I said things like that. So now it's JDPA, JD Power. So those of you who are familiar with JD Power, they're the ones that are always advertised. You know, this Oldsmobile car, or that Cadillac, or this Toyota is the best car out there. JD Power is actually a big uh, customer analysis uh, company that does all sorts of analysis of, of public perception of products and that kind of thing. And they bought Umbria. PowerSet got bought by Microsoft. Many of these other companies don't actually exist anymore because they also got bought. A uh, little collective intellect is still running around down on, on Pearl Street someplace in the space that Google used to be in. So there's lots of stuff going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about what all these companies do in a couple of minutes. All right, so there are jobs out there. 